Um, I, I'm Frank Farina. I will be teaching at Bucknell Effective uh, August. Uh, I've been teaching other places prior to that. Uh, and at Bucknell, I'll be teaching taxation and fundamentals of accounting too. But in my prior roles, I've taught uh, just about everything except intermediate accounting. And this presentation uh, is going to focus on really on two classes, mostly on my auditing class, but on the accounting seminar. I won't be teaching those at Bucknell, but they're the basis of this uh, uh, presentation today. So, um, and we all, and I, in my material, some of what I have, I've got a few PowerPoints here that aren't in, the, aren't in the materials and a couple that are, but they're in color here, not black and white. So you'll see them a little bit better. And there's a paper uh, as well as these PowerPoints. So um, accounting students, and by way of background, uh, I've been a member of the PICPA for uh, 32 years. And uh, I've been practicing law for 35 years. So I've got kind of a combined background. But we know that accounting students, uh, as any students, have a continuing need to develop effective communication skills, oral and written. Uh, whether they stay in public accounting, whether they go to companies, whether they go to law school, whatever they're going to do, they have to have it. And most accounting programs, including Bucknell, uh, have some kind of writing requirement for the business students uh, that, that they call writing across the curriculum. And they're designed to encourage all students to develop their written communication skills, generally focusing on the kinds of writing that they're going to have to do within their major. You know, obviously an accounting student has to develop different writing skills than a uh, literature major. Uh, they, they teach the skills necessary to write for that course of discipline. And every school I've had, uh, I've taught, has used the accounting seminar as the capstone or culminating course and as the designating writing course for accounting majors. Um, in a two of those schools where I previously taught, I taught accounting seminar and auditing in a sequence. I had auditing in the fall, the accounting seminar in the spring. Some schools use the auditing class as the, as the capstone. I had the luxury of having both those courses. I taught both those courses. I had students among other classes for those six hours in a row. Uh, now, one of the schools I was at changed from a three credit to a four credit course model. Uh, and Bucknell's on a four credit course model. So that helps out in getting to the 150 within the context of the four years. So when that occurred, we had to add a third more uh, content to the course. And I thought, well, this would be a great time to add some kind of writing and presentation uh, assignment that would be the prequel to what they were going to do in the seminar class. In my seminar class, they had to do a research paper. They had to come up with a thesis. They had to give me an outline. I beat it up. They gave it back. I beat it up again um, and that kind of thing. So this way, I was going to get them to do a little bit of writing, a little bit of presenting in auditing that would then help them the next semester in seminar. Um, and it would also serve as, as kind of a flipped assignment because uh, as you'll see in a minute when we talk about what the assignment was, they were going to wind up uh, summarizing and presenting a topic to their fellow students in class. It was going to make them become the master of that topic, make them present the topic, and give them a little bit of experience being behind a podium and uh, uh, something covered not within the uh, uh, course itself. So here's the, uh, I've got it in the slides, but let me pull the document up so you can see what it looks like here. All right, so here's what the assignment looked like. Um, you're, you're, you're a senior accountant for a multi-office regional accounting firm. They, they have a full-time accounting practice. Um, now the busy season is over, you're hanging out in the staff room, and the uh, partner who's in charge of the annual firm retreat sees you, and she beelines over and says, hey, I was cleaning off my, my desk, and I found this report. I think that a presentation on this report would be a great thing to do at the seminar. Uh, oh, okay, well, what do I have to do? Well, uh, you have to do a, a PowerPoint, and you have to do a written paper, and the product should stand alone, right? The, the PowerPoint or the paper should convey everything to standalone products. How long should it be? Well, whatever it's going to take, uh, and uh, how long do I have to do it? Uh, I want both in final form three weeks from today. And make sure you do a good job. You could be promoted to manager in the fall if you do it right. So basically, the assignment was a one-paragraph synopsis of whatever the document they were handed, a one-paragraph par statement of why that document 
is going to be pertinent to the firm's practice. It could be pertinent to how they do their work. It could be pertinent to their clients. It could be pertinent to firm development. It could be to personal development. Whatever that, that document is, I want you to prepare a paragraph to tell me why that's important. Uh, and then I want the final report, and then I want the PowerPoint, and I want you to uh, uh, present. We'll have a, a schedule that everybody would present. So uh, uh, that's kind of what the assignment was. Uh, the the uh, topics that they would present on were picked by me. So I had, uh, over the years, had a, a drawer where I would accumulate different reports. And I would have these reports uh, from all sorts, a lot of GAO reports on the accounting profession or the mandated study on consolidation and competition in, uh, in uh, uh, the accounting, public accounting firms. Um, how come this isn't moving? A lot of GAO reports, uh, as you can see, um, some OIG reports from the SEC OIG report, the failure to timely investigate the allegations of financial fraud at Metro Media, the uh, investigation of the SEC's response to concerns regarding uh, Robert Allen Stanford's alleged uh, Ponzi scheme, um, uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, report on uh, Free Enterprise Fund versus PCAOB. So there's a wide variety of, of topics here. We'll go over a few of them. But um, I just had the, uh, uh, the report, Complaint Against KPMG for Negligence and Aiding and Abetting in the uh, uh, New Century Holdings case. So I had some. That's, by the way, in my, in my uh, uh, legal career, that's what I did is I, I did class action suing companies and auditors. So that's kind of what I did. <laughs> so. Just, just so you know. So, <laughs> what can I say? All right, so I, I would get, let's go back to the slides for a minute. Um, all right, so you have to do this. Uh, I have many sources, my junk drawer, magazine articles, journals, things I get from AICPA. I've been a member there for 42 years, uh, various websites. And then to get the topics and be sure everything, I do kind of a, you ever do one of these Pollyanna selections at Christmas where you bring in your gifts and you pick numbers, and I did that with these papers. It'd be kind of a fun thing. So I'd have all the topics lined up on a table, and then they would draw numbers, and the first guy would pick, and he'd come up and pick his paper, and the second, number two, could steal his or pick another one, and we kind of, we make it big, and there's this big, you know, and basically these students are funny. They'll say, oh, here's one that's only this thick. That's the one I want to do. Oh, here's one that's that thick. I don't want that one. And so they would, and sometimes that's not the right way to go about it, but they would, we, they would all wind up with one. I would pre-select the reports, they wouldn't know which one they were going to get, and then they would do this competition to get the one they were going to have to present on. So, so that uh, uh, kind of made it a fun thing. Um, and then here are the ones that within my slides and in my paper. I have a list of all the different uh, uh, ones here. Let me go by all those. Okay, so, uh, and then, so they would make their uh, presentation. Oop, what happened here? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Let's go back up here. I shouldn't look at the screen, huh? And there'd be a presentation guide um, that the, their fellow students would fill out. And they would, they would fill these out and say, uh, what did you think of the presentation? And I'd try to get them to focus on organization. Uh, uh, did it get your attention? Was it well organized? Uh, did the speaker seem familiar and comfortable? And they would fill these out. Most times they'd be pretty kind to the kids. You never got anybody who was really mean about it. And sometimes they'd make funny comments. But I would, I would provide all of these analyses from, and generally these classes had anywhere from 20 to 25 people. So they would get, everybody the next class would get a copy of their presentation uh, results from the other students so they could see what it was. And I would give detailed uh, feedback it, at uh, stages one and two. When they gave me their proposals, because I knew what the reports were, because I read them all before I uh, put them on the assignment list, and they'd come back to me with their, their synopsis and their one paragraph, and I would edit that. And then when they would give me the, uh, uh, the papers and the PowerPoints, I would take the time to go over them and review them as if they were one of my associate attorneys or one of my auditors and staff, uh, uh, staff auditors in the field when I was in public accounting at Ernst. I would just do that. I mean, I would spend the time. I know a lot of professors, a lot of you, perhaps, other, uh, 
uh, faculty I've worked with don't want to spend the time individually. Oh, I'll let them write what they want and I'll give them a grade. If it's an F, it's an F. My goal is to go through and edit it. And if they use the wrong word, if, they, if they're too passive or active, it's, to me it's, it's, a, it's a writing assignment where I can convey to them my thoughts on their paper and perhaps, particularly in research, in my uh, seminar class, they wind up with research papers that are writing samples. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, the young lady who presented on Excel today said, oh, you know, keep your Excel projects and you can bring them as part of your portfolio. Well, these kids, when they got done writing these papers, had uh, work product that they could bring, writing samples. If they were asked for one, they could bring it. So I would give them very detailed uh, feedback, and I could determine if they engaged with the topic or not, had, had not engaged with the topic. Uh, and um, at the end, I would give them, let me pull this up before we, I think I have this here. I would give them, a, at the end of all the presentations, I would then give them a reflective essay assignment. I would say, you've reviewed or presented on a topic, and presumably you were present when your classmates presented. Uh, and uh, I've put a complete list of the presentations on Blackboard, and I want you to give me a three-page essay on the report of your choosing to explain how and why you think that uh, paper or topic was relevant to this auditing course. So they, they, would, they would hear all these you know, 20 presentations. And then I'd say, pick one. Don't pick your own. Don't pick your buddies. Don't trade it with somebody else. Tell me, uh, pick one that you thought was particularly relevant to the objectives of the auditing course. And I've got a few of those samples. I didn't put those on the, on the PICPA website. But you can tell me. In, the, uh, in my class, the, uh, the course description and rationale was auditing is a systematic process of objectively obtaining and evaluating evidence regarding assertions about economic actions and events to ascertain the degree of correspondence between what's being asserted, the financial statements, if that's what it is, and established criteria and communicating the re results to interested users. So for those of you who've been auditors or taught auditing, you've got uh, the financials in accordance with GAAP, was the work done in accordance with GAAS, and how's that all being communicated? So that's what auditing is about, is, is critical analysis, critical thinking, and skepticism and all the kinds of things you do. Uh, and then, and that's what I, in my learning outcomes, these are from my syllabus for auditing, what are students learning? Define uh, professional skepticism, uh, define information risk, and explain how financial statement auditing process helps reduce this risk, understand the development and source of gas, understand the importance of planning an audit engagement so it's conducted in accordance with professional standards, um, Define what's meant by the proper form and content of audit documentation. Explain auditors' responsibility for risk assessment and undersource, understand sources of inherent risk factors, including the client's business and environment. So they're in an audit class. Those are the outcomes. Uh, I've told them what auditing is, what the process is, why that's important. And now they're going to be looking at some of these uh, reports that aren't necessarily from AICPA or have anything directly to do with auditing but they're, they're generating uh, questions in their mind, generating some thoughtfulness as to how their roles as auditors uh, are going to occur. Um, so let's look at, so you've got the PowerPoint. So let's look at a couple of these uh, that, uh, um, some that are in your work papers and some that aren't. So here's one. I'll start with this one. Uh, probably you're familiar with uh, New Century Holdings. Uh, the ones you have, by the way, these, these I pulled up are in better color, have the students' names on them. You won't know them because they're from other schools. Uh, this guy, Michael Massal, was the bankruptcy court examiner on uh, New Century. And if, if you don't remember, uh, it was one of the largest subprime lenders, subprime lenders in the nation. They went bankrupt in 2007. It marked the beginning of the collapse of the subprime uh, mortgage market. KPMG resigned shortly thereafter. And the U.S. trustee hired this guy, Michael Massal, as an examiner to determine accounting uh, or financial statement irregularities. So this is the presentation. This guy issued a report. This is the student presentation that was put together to uh, sum it up. And there's background of New Century and what are adjustable rate loans and what are stated income loans, you know, what are liars loans, all those kinds of things. Um, and uh, what did New Century do? Well, they had retail sales of loans. They, they originated loans and sold them off. Uh, they securitized them and structured them for sales as bonds. 
uh, all that sort of stuff. So the, the report goes through and it talks about uh, all the kinds of things uh, they looked at. And the they, they found that New Century devoted little attention to improving loan quality and did not focus specific attention until the final quarter of 2006, which was too late to prevent the consequences of longstanding loan quality. Uh, management failed to notice several red flags, uh, increase in early payment defaults, increasingly competitive subprime market, a rise in interest rates, an increase in investor rejections of loans, so-called kickouts, uh, all the kinds of things that we all remember now, the, the, the big financial crisis from 2007, 2008, which a lot occurred because they were just making loans they shouldn't have made. Um, um, now here's, and this is kind of this, uh, red flags of deteriorating quality. Now this is a quote that they had from an email. I think the group who are receiving this email needs to get together and discuss the operating center audits. If recollection is correct, every sin uh, sick audit completed has been unsatisfactory, which to me sounds like we need to amend A-M-M-E-N-D policy as much as clean up our act. The financial results that have been accomplished over the past few years, are, this is why you need writing for accounts. This is somebody internally, that the, the guy who's the president of the mortgage corporation, that's direct quotes from his email. So this particular report went through and, and uh, talked about loans and what the problems were, uh, KPMG staffing issues and erroneous advice. Uh, I won't go through it all, but I'll go to the recommendations. So you go through all this, uh, and, uh, and after presenting this, what are the implications for our firm of this uh, I issue? Ensure that all audit personnel are sufficiently competent in their abilities and versed in the business or industries in which they'll be auditing. One of the problems with the KPMG staffing of this audit uh, and, and being someone who, not just KPMG, but being someone who spent 30 years looking at audit failure, I can tell you that what frequently happens is people get assigned to jobs because of turnover, people leave, it's busy season. Understaffing or, or people staffed below their level who can't rise to the occasion get on these jobs and they're put under a lot of pressure and the work doesn't get done right. And sometimes it results in this and sometimes it doesn't. But that's, I can tell you personally, I've looked at lots of audit work papers over the years, and that's what happens is that the personnel aren't sufficiently competent in that case. Uh, don't acquiesce to management's whim or accept their assumptions at face value, skepticism. When questionable accounting practices arise, bring in trained specialists to shed light. Uh, consider eliminating clients that have a questionable reputation or assign more experienced partners to those audits. Understand the limitations of following industry practice. So these, this, this particular paper was done by two students because the, the report was much thicker. But this is the kind of thing, they put this on and then say, well, the, the context was we're presenting this at our auditing firm. Here's a bad thing that happened. What are the implications for our firm? Don't do these things. All right, let's look at another one. Because um, I want to give you the flavor of, of what some of these students were uh, uh, putting on. Okay, here's, here's one, and this kind of came up. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, Trump administration, you may recall that uh, they were criticizing the president for flying to Florida. That he was, you know, oh, he's using his private jet and he's going down to his, his place in Florida all the time. Well, believe it or not, prior to that, um, somebody in Congress had asked for uh, GAO, Senator John Barrasso, requested that they identify, GAO identify the costs associated with the specific presidential trip by President Obama. So they were looking at Obama's flight problems ahead of time. And so what did they do? The particular tr uh, trip was from Chicago to Palm Beach. Uh, it was in 2013. They looked, explored two governmental departments, uh, DOD and the Department of Homeland Security, and they looked at the costs, interviewed various people to see, well, what did this trip cost? Uh, and it talks, the report talks about the background of presidential travel. POTUS has to be able to travel anywhere at any time and has to always be on military aircraft. DOD has provided military aircraft for any presidential travel since 1933, uh, beginning with Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, um, you know, Ike did this, JFK did that. The Secret Service has to provide protection. Um, uh, what goes into presidential travel? Uh, they, they have to use a backup Boeing that's identical to the main plan, plane. They have to use other aircraft for cargo and support items. Uh, these are the kinds of planes that they use for these uh, presidential things. Super Galaxies, Hercules. Uh, uh, 
since, since presidential travel requires so much support, the expenses can get rather large. This trip was estimated at 3.6 million, and that doesn't include the cost that are marked as classified and salaries and benefits of US government employees involved with travel. Uh, the largest cost factor is the cost per flying hour for the military aircraft, which are absorbed by the Air Force and the Marine Corps. The Secret Service protection. And they do this particular trip, and they show you where the planes came from, and so GAO. And one of the things, by the way, because uh, some of my students never had heard of GAO. They don't realize that the GAO has, and when I went to, I got my MBA at, at George Washington University, and there were a lot of people at GAO getting their MBAs at GW at the time. It's right in DC, they could go at night, and back then that they came in, worked at GAO, got their MBAs at GW. So they don't realize that the GAO, the breadth of the kinds of reports that they do, uh, and it's, it's, it's a real career option for people if they don't want to be in public accounting. Now, you could be a CPA and then go to GAO, or you could just go to GAO. So anyway, this is the kind of report. So they, they go all through this, he goes through the costs, Let me, oh, and then he gets to the, I'll get to the last slide. So they, they, damn. Okay. Pertinence to our firm. It gives uh, professional staff a view into the public sector. It shows how, how much it costs the government to transport the president. It shows a breakdown of what goes into it. It's a very small amount compared to the federal budget. This can show our clients how spending can get out of control without a budget. The vast majority of our clients will not have an unlimited budget. So this kind of thing, well, how do you take this kind of, it's interesting because GEO did the report. They find it fascinating that, oh, yeah, the president's travel and how much does it cost? Well, how does it relate to us or to our firm? And so this student tried to, uh, you know, say, well, this is how it's pertinent to what we're doing. Um, let me look at another one here. Um, okay. Now, anybody uh, familiar with the SEC's con conflict minerals rule? Okay. Con conflict minerals. Uh, are uh, tantalum, tungsten, tin, and gold. These are the kinds of things. And this paper, GAO said, uh, uh, the SEC has said we need disclosure as to, for companies. We want public financial reports to show, do you, do you buy these things? Where do you get them? Do you know what's your um, uh, uh, line of how you, uh, your acquisition costs are? So GAO did this. They want to uh, address the exploitation of conflict minerals, how they're contributing to conditions in the Democrat Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, and will uh, the conflict uh, minerals rule be effective? So uh, this person got in, and she was African American. She got into the, uh, the DRC, the background, the illegal armed group, sexual violence, mass killings, uh, Dodd-Frank states that uh, conflict in the DRC is stemming from the exploitation of conflict minerals, um, smuggling, illegal trade. Uh, and so the rule said companies must disclose their use of conflict minerals and the origin of these minerals. And it applies to companies that report to the SEC under Section 13A or 15D of the uh, 34 Act and that use conflict materials in the production of its goods. So if you think about it, now I never worked, and there's 6,000 companies affected by this. I never worked on an audit where you had to worry about what your client was gathering for this information, but I guess some auditors do now, right? Anybody actually work on an audit, audit where you had a, this came to play? No? Well, it's, it's presented in a section of the 10K that is not audited. Right. Our advisory practice, interestingly, and other firms were uh, you know, developing some ways to help companies pull that together for our non-audit clients and provide a service around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not part of the audit financials per se. Right. Right. right, but it's in the 10K and you, you can't, you have to look, you have to look at it. So, so some of the students... The specific requirement is make sure it's not inconsistent with information in the financial statement. Right, right. right. So, so uh, she, she talked about uh, when she did this report and there was a SEC flow chart that summarized the conflict minerals rule and, and how do you get to it and where they gather this information. They have similar now requirements about the environmental issues and financial statements. So the students are, are surprised that, wow, accountants get involved with these kinds of issues. So, um, um, and they have to file a disclosure report and reasonable country of origin report. 
Um, so she went all through this, summarizing the report, and said, well, our audit firm's responsibilities. We have to follow the SEC flow chart. We have to know which forms are required, know when to file. We have to gather information through the tiers of the supply. I guess she really means the client should gather information through the tiers of the supply chain. Uh, if we do a good job, we may attract more clients. We'll be indirectly aiding in the reduction of violence seen in the Eastern De De uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. So some of the students were kind of impressed that, wow, you know, there's a social issue to be an accountant. You know, you have to gather information and make, you're, you're you know, addressing these problems in the Congo and, and coming up with these uh, disclosures. So these kinds of reports uh, were, were, you know, kind of interesting to them. Okay, we'll look at one more. Um, Okay, now here's another one, and this may be some of you, as I say, I, I oop, security alert, what would that mean? All right, now, here, here's an issue that is uh, older than time. When do audit managers prefer staff to under-report time? Now, this particular, this was a research, I've belonged to, and then I've belonged to AAA for 45 years. So I've been going to the conferences and getting documents, and sometimes there's actually an interesting research report in a AAA publication. And these guys did a study of when do audit managers prefer staff to under-report time? Because uh, this can be an issue. You, you get uh, an auditor, what is it? An auditor doesn't charge all of their work hours on a client's account. It Im the impact adversely affects the quality of auditing. It can lead to actions that can intensify risk. So that's what happens with underreporting of time. Uh, now, there can be policies, uh, but, but uh, audit managers may discreetly reward underreporting by engagement staff. Why? Because they come in under budget. Work long hours and say it took, I remember running to that public accounting, I'd get in a job and uh, I'd see that it took 55 hours, who knows, the prior year, and I, my budget this year was 10. You know, what's that all about? So, and, and we didn't get paid overtime, but you know, anyway, anyway. They, they reward under-reporting. It creates an atmosphere that it's needed in order to, uh, for staff to thrive and evolve within a firm. Unreasonable time constraints cause auditors to fall short in collecting sufficient evidence. Um, so uh, uh, audit managers should eliminate under-reporting because it oftentimes affects the quantity of output. Time budgets and constraints are a problem. Uh, my purpose is to explore this issue within our firm and provide suggestions to manage the problem effectively. So the issue in this paper, and as she was presenting, remember, she's presenting this, she's using the paper to present at a uh, seminar. Um, what, what can you do? The firm policies say don't do it, but, you know, sometimes those are honored in the breach, right? So uh, public accounting watchdog groups have expressed concern that the practice of underreporting can negatively affect audit quality can lead to unethical behaviors that increase audit risk. It tacitly re, uh, rewarded by audit managers because you, you came in under budget, even though you worked harder. Um, and it can result in uh, uh, budgets for the next year that are unrealistic. Uh, Underreporting, no rewards. Partners don't reward under-reporters. Uh, partners penalize under-reporters and staff who report exceeding budget. Uh, what do we do? She talks about some of the changes. Let's see. Time constraints given to underreporters poses problem when auditors who do not underreport time. So it's frustrating because I report all my time and uh, you know, he's not reporting his. He makes it look he's more efficient than I am. Um, so I talked about the uh, remedies. Meet with audit managers to see why they choose underreporting as an option. Uh, is the auditor s slow conducting the audit? Take the power from the client's hands on how they want to pay us for their jobs and assign our own cost and time. Grant Thornton, PwC, and Deloitte practice these methods and their history and reputation is reputable and notable. Um, and then some counter arguments. Let me get to where she concludes all these fancy things here. Uh, the, the significance of the situation as it relates to our firm's practice, what we need to ensure our audit manager not giving out a false representation of our firm's goals and business. The mission of this firm is to continue to provide honest, accurate, and timely audit reporting to our uh, clients. Uh, a work environment that shows that we work smarter and not harder, um, etc. 
So uh, Belk's auditing firm. So these are the kinds of things that uh, uh, these students report on that, um, you know, and try to come up with a way that uh, shows that it's relevant to what they're doing. Now, let me go to the compendium. No, that's not it. So here's the, uh, that's what they had to do for the reflective essay assignment. Let me see where the, let me go back to the, I thought I, okay, I have a summary of, I just want to show you what some of these people said about these presentations. Um, oh wait, wait, I want, there's one more PowerPoint I want to look at. Because again, this is something that, that you uh, don't always see cover in a, in a corporate, uh, in, a, in an auditing class, all right? This, uh, there was a review done on uh, proxy advisory firms. Anybody ever deal with a proxy advisory firm? Know anything about them? Uh, GAO did a report and said, uh, what influence do proxy advisory firms have in voting and corporate governance? Uh, how firms develop and apply policies to make vote recommendations and increase transparency? So this report dealt with, uh, uh, you know, what are uh, the key participants in the proxy voting for shareholder meetings? The shareholder, the issuer, an institutional investor, a proxy advisory firm that's a third party that provides services to institutional investors that include research and vote recommendations on proposals. And then you have proxy solicitors and proxy agents. And there are five firms in the US that do this. ISS, Glass-Lewis, Egan Jones, Marco Consulting, and Proxy Vote. So a lot of these students, this isn't the kind of thing that would be typically covered in an audit textbook, but you know, they don't think about, well, yeah, what happens with, we're doing financial reports and auditing financial reports, and when it comes time to vote for the uh, the directors to vote for some proposal, to vote for retention of the auditors. You know, who's handling, who's making recommendations on these kinds of things? So this report talked about uh, who these five companies are, uh, what they do. Uh, they have to register. Proxy advisory firms uh, have to register uh, in most cases, although I see Glass-Lewis is not because uh, they're not, not applicable, it says. Um, so it goes through, talks about why we have a demand for increased ownership for proxy advisory firms. Institutional ownership has gone up. You know, the small investor doesn't own most stock. Big mutual funds and other institutions do. Um, uh, what's the extent? They wanted to look, GAO looked and said, well, you know, large institutional investors cast a majority of proxy votes, and how do they arrive at their, their answers? How are they relying on these firms? So uh, this provided insight. So, how does this relate to our firm? Well, our clients may use proxy advisory firms for shareholder meetings. We need to understand the process of how the firms gather information. Uh, we should look at proxy statements given to our clients to ensure they're in our best interest, um, in their best interest. Our firm, our firm must make sure that our clients properly pay the services that they hire. Uh, so this is kind of, once again, it's not a topic that they would normally hear about in an auditing textbook, but something that as a general awareness of what the business world is about, uh, they would want to hear about. All right, so let me go back, if I can find it here, to the, uh, I just, the last thing I want to show you, here's the compendium, kind of show you what they uh, said about this stuff. Okay, so uh, here's somebody, he wrote about, uh, there was a report called the Fraud Resistant Organization. Uh, by now, we know that auditing is a systematic process of objectively obtaining and evaluating evidence. In class, there are many great reports that mention how they could affect the way an auditing firm's everyday business is conducted or how it needs to change, you know, for example, underreporting of time. Uh, but based on the definition above, there was one project that I believed was most relevant. Uh, Drew Ingram's presentation, it wasn't a GAO report, that's my handwriting, on the fraud resistant organization takes the cake because it's all about fraud which is what auditors are trying to detect when doing an audit. Um, the report goes into detail about why the anti-fraud collaboration was created and what they focused on preventing so there are less opportunities to commit fraud. So he summarized the report, you know, because I asked him, I said, well, tell me what you thought was relevant. Um, 
It's relevant uh, advancing the understanding of the co contributions that contribute to, to fraud, promoting additional efforts to increase skepticism, encouraging a long-term perspective uh, so, so as to moderate the risk of focusing only short-term results. Uh, let's see, next student also talked about fraud resistant organizations. So they, they were, in, you know, so too. Um, while all the presentations, this one was uh, talked about internal control. While all the presentations were relevant to auditing, I feel like Brad Dowdall's was one of the main subjects that relate to our class. Since auditing is all about financial reporting, his presentation is about the internal controls involved with it. He did a presentation that was on internal, uh, an internal control report, and once again, he talked about uh, internal controls and why I think that's important. Um, Uh, the Madoff Ponzi scheme, that was one of them. The, the SEC conducted an investigation of the failure of the, uh, the, the SEC Office of Inspector General, the OIG. So right away, that's another thing. GAO, OIG, what do these, what do these groups do? Uh, they conduct an investigation of why the SEC uh, failed to uncover Madoff's Ponzi scheme. I don't know if you're aware of that, but um, there was a particular guy, I can't think of his name right now, who kept bringing it to the SEC's attention that Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme and the SEC just kept blowing them off, or one office thought the other office was doing it, no office was doing it. So a lot of people, and there were lawsuits filed that got dismissed um, over the fact that the SEC was a contributor. It could have been you know, caught much, much earlier had they done their job and they didn't do their job. So this guy, this kid thought, I liked it, Madoff was charged by the SEC, anti-fraud provisions of the, uh, the 33 and 34 acts, uh, uh, in December 2008, SEC discovered many accounts of credible and specific reports of Madoff's criminal financial actions were brought to the attention of the SEC staff but were never sent to the commission for action. Um, so they investigated to find out why and they found out that uh, uh, they, they just dropped the ball on this. Uh, and this now this, this kid right said the report by the OIG of the SEC is important to the auditing course because there are several things that we cover that could have helped them discovering Madoff's Ponzi scheme. One of the first things they should have done is check their own internal controls, which they didn't do. Um, what else does he say? The next and probably most important reason that this report shows how important professional skepticism is in the auditing world. During many of the investigations or examinations, the SEC employees took things at face value. In one section of the report, it said that at times, they came across something, they would just ask Mr. Madoff about it, and take his answer. Hey, hey Bernie, what about that? Oh, that's okay. So, okay. so anyway, they, they thought, they, this, this particular student uh, thought that that was interesting. Um, let's see, one more I want to look at here. Oh, there's Mr. Cook talked about that. Uh, oh, older, here's one. Uh, now, older Americans. Uh, the, S, the GAO did a report on the, and this is timely, the number of older Americans people on, on uh, Social Security who still have student debt. Can you believe being on Social Security and have student debt? And that's a problem. They can't repay it. They're on Social Security. So he says, uh, this guy uh, Applegate did the report. Mr. Applegate talked about there's a, a small percentage of Americans in their later years that are in a financial position that would allot, not allow them to pay back student loans. While there's a small percentage today in 2017, this like, seems like a problem that could very easily get out of hand in 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years or more. Uh, Post-secondary education costs have steadily increased. This means that for the majority of folks going to, entering college, student loans are going to be taken out in order to attend. It's not uncommon for graduates to exit with five-figure debt, pile that on top of credit cards, rent, or house payment, or other bills. You've got a recipe for bankruptcy unless your job pays a great sum. That's why it doesn't make any sense to graduate with the degree that doesn't guarantee a well-paying job to pay off student loans. This all relates back to our auditing course because two of our learning outcomes state, explain auditors' responsibility for risk assessment and understand sources of inherent risk factors, uh, including the client's business environment. The main idea of these two outcomes in risk, uh, risk involving the client. An organization needs to know about its client. This included knowing their financial status. Uh, so it all makes sense why you, 
keep saying, well, you cannot understand why people would choose to get a degree in which they cannot get a job that would allow them to pay off their loans. I guess I say that in class. It just doesn't make any sense. It's why, it's why we all should get accounting degrees so we can all be nearly guaranteed jobs after graduation. Now, I, I, and I, I wrote down there and I said, yeah, but don't lose sight of the need to be able to communicate and having an awareness of history and culture. Hopefully in my classes, you've seen me demonstrate much wider knowledge than debits and credits. So I don't know if he was pandering to me, or maybe I do say that, like I don't know why this person is majoring in sociology or whatever it is. Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. Let me see if I have that uh, PowerPoint real quick. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, then, you know, let me, well, I, I, I've I don't have to pull that one up. So, that, so the whole point of this writing exercise is to get them practice and they get up in front of the, uh, the, the room, they present the, uh, the report. They, I didn't show you any of the written reports, but as I say, I spend a lot of time doing that. So uh, does anybody uh, do a similar exercise in, in one of their classes? I do an Ed, just a minute. And what do, you, what do you base that on? I typically find a court case where the substantial understatement penalty has been assessed, and then I make a case out of that, and then they have to prepare um, what we call table of, of authorities. So they have a standard format, IRAC memorandum, which you probably know from your legal background. So they have to do issue, rule, application, conclusion. Mm -hmm and basically determine, can I sign the tax return given these circumstances? And to do that, they have to recite the rules related to that, apply the rules to the facts and circumstances, and conclude. Right. Okay. And so they have to actually submit the table of authorities documenting their research, as well as their IRAC memorandum. Right. Um, and I do that all electronically. And one of the things, trying to streamline it, is to grade electronically and provide them with comments right on their Word document. Right. So they're all, they're all writing on the same case study? That's correct. OK, and are they doing any in-class presentations? Um, not on that one, no. OK, is anybody doing anything where they're, they're, they're whether or not it's unique? I guess because you wouldn't want 20 people presenting in class on the, see the nice part about this is that it's 20 different reports. It's not like five, you know, 20 people reporting on one thing. Does anybody else do anything where, yes, what do you do? So I teach external audit, and um, one of the things I do is I'll have groups. So this is in groups, but uh, so they just they do a, essentially a, they don't perform the audit, but they create a whole audit plan for a for a business process. So I usually use something like revenue, where it says, okay, pick a pick a public company and think about okay, well, what's the risk in your industry, and find the industry guidance and talk about kind of where do you think the pain points are and what types of audit tests would be specifically relevant to your industry. So if you're um, I don't know, auditing a retail company, going and looking at um, returns or some, something to that effect. Thinking about, okay, so something that's specific, uh, so not just kind of a general idea of, okay, what the textbook would say, but thinking about how that would apply to a specific context. Mm -hmm. And then they present as a group? Correct. Okay, yeah. yeah. So any, anybody else do anything individually where they present? Okay. Way back there. Come on, Felicia, hurry up. I have students put together case studies. Uh, they use the uh, IRS website uh, fraud alerts. So they do the research. Um, they've got, uh, they're required to pull the affidavit. They reflect on it, do reflection, talk about the legality, the ethics. They use that in tax. I also use that in audit mm -hmm. as well. Okay, and then they, and so they're individual, uh, they're, they're each doing something unique? Yes. Okay. Well, it depends on the size of the class. I mean, I've had, I've had groups of up to three, oh, okay. you know, yeah. in a larger class, in an audit setting, yeah. and, you know, individually, you know, when it's been, you know, less than 10. Yeah, because the biggest, the biggest, it's kind of interesting, at it, it Bucknell, evidently, because uh, I've never taught where they had this, but I'll be teaching classes like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but then there's a common hour in the evening, one evening a week, like for, from, it's an hour, but it's two hours seven and nine, and you can use that for the presentations, for example, because the biggest drawback that I had with doing this, because it was great to have, you know, pre prepare these presentations, 
but you know, time and giving up classroom time was hard. But if you've got this extra hour, uh, it you know, at night, and you could even have people from other classes come in and watch their presentation. Unfortunately, I'd be teaching tax, so I won't be doing this. But that's what I would do if I was there. Yes, I've done a variety of different written items. Uh, the only one that they've done individually is for advanced accounting, where they have to pick a company for a merger and acquisition and do the whole paper on that. They don't present that. But then in auditing, I have them do a fraud case as a group. And they have to write the paper, and then they have to do the presentation for that. Right, right. OK. Uh, OK, one Jerry down here. Just a general comment, Frank. I think this whole thing is great. Um, I believe writing has really become a lost art. And the last few years before I left KPMG, I used to cringe when I would read memoranda prepared by new staff accountants. You know, they all grew up texting and punctuation. You would think they would at least spell check it, right? But yeah. too often they didn't. And this, the lack of substance was noticeable. And I think, um, you know, hopefully accounting educators realize that writing is incredibly important for accountants, right? It's not just all about the numbers. A lot of what they do needs to be communicated, documented in the work papers. So I think this is terrific. My question is, it's very substantive. The, the information you're requiring them to read and absorb and then write and the editing process you described and ultimately the presentation. So how many hours do they devote to it and how much of their total grade is based on it? OK. Uh, uh, with respect to the total grade, I'm sure it's not more than you know 15 or 20 percent because I also would give a number of exams. I, I, I use, give them a lot of grading opportunities. Uh, as far as the time, you know, some of these, first of all, they're not writing the underlying report. They're looking, it's almost like a, like a super-sized book report in a way, because they're looking at this report, just them and no one else, and then they're, they're going to do a synopsis of the report. So they're more like synthesizing and putting it together. It, it, yeah, some of them might. Now, the ones that really take that long, uh, I've done with two people. Very few, like that one in the Masal report uh, the, for New Century. There was another one on Lehman Brothers. Uh, I had two guy, two people, both wound up with PwC after they graduated. Very bright kids. So, uh, so those reports. But a lot of them, you know, they're twenty or thirty pages, and you know, they kind of. That's why I make them give me the one page. Read this thing and tell me what it's about. And then if they, if they don't get it in one page, I'll say, well, no, what did you think about this, this, this? So I try to, to at least get with them at that point and tell me what's important about it. OK, you've got these two little one-page things. OK, now go do your work, because I know you're going to go down the right path. Because I, I try to do that. It's like outline. Kids don't use outlines to write anything these days. And, and if you can do that a little bit, at least focus them a little bit. And I do the same thing with, in the seminar class when they have to write they're a little abstract of what you could, and that's independent research, and that takes a lot of time. But this is a little, little bit less. I'd say the downside is, on the one hand, it takes up a lot of classes because I can only do three. I give them 20 minutes a piece, so they can only do three per class. And so it takes you know, a week and a half to get them done. But some of the reports they find very interesting. And, and so I've tried to, you know, and, and, and they're there to learn something. They're not there just to, to, to learn about debits and credits or gas or, you know, um, I saw the Excel thing looking for, you know, when you do proof of cash, remember four column proof of cash? You know, what's this NSF uh, charge and where does it go? And she was kind of moving things around like that. So they're not just there to learn that, but I try to uh, have them learn lots of other stuff too. Okay, anything else? Yes. Um, uh, I have the students do a paper uh, in my intermediate classes on a controversial topic that has something to do with accounting. So it might be, is outsourcing good for the economy? Um, immigrants, and how are immigrants affecting the economy? Um, and uh, give me another example. Uh, student loans, uh, student debt, and what's happening with student debt. So the students are doing controversial issues that are tied to accounting. And then what I did up until two years ago, they had to do a PowerPoint presentation. Now I allow them to do an artistic expression of their paper. And it is amazing what comes in. They might do a PowerPoint. I have not had a PowerPoint last year at all. Um, it, but it is truly amazing when you see 
what accountants can come up with. Uh-huh. <laughs> An artistic, uh, <laughs> they can, they, they can do that. They can do, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I thought one student was gonna do that, write a song on it, but she didn't. Um, I get paintings, um, I've gotten a student this year on the, um, on the loans, it was an image of a person and colored with how much of her income went, went to loans, with all this loan information written on the person itself. Uh, it is amazing. I had glasses uh, looking at uh, immigrants through a different lens and they had these huge glasses that they made and all the information within the glasses. I mean, it, it, do CEOs pay? And it was a painting. CEOs were really, really big and their, and their employees were really, really little. Um, it was, it really is, and it really gets them out of, you know, their comfort zone. Yeah. Here, this is, and I'll end on this. Um, this, uh, I don't know if this will click, but one, that underreporting of time this was illustrated, oh see this was, it's not coming up here. She had, this was like an exploding clock. It would be like your artist. So you clicked on it and it went and then the clock explodes. So that kind of, that was like an artistic representation of your head exploding for underreporting of time. And, her, and she put that in, I didn't ask her to, but I see I don't, the link's not coming up. I'm probably not connected to the, the, the internet up here, so that's why it's. It should have been embedded, but it's not coming up. We don't have to show it. I just, it's, it would have, when I clicked on it earlier today, that's, it starts going around and then it just kind of explodes. But, all right, now one last thing I'll say is that uh, of the, of the, there's a exhibit B to my paper that's on the website has a, a, a very, a list of about 80 different reports and I have all of them in one folder, which is way too, it's like 200 megabytes or whatever. It's too big to send, but if you for some reason would like to get all 80 of those papers, the GAO reports, all those reports in one spot. And if you give me a, uh, a flash drive, I can just move that right on to uh, your flash drive if you like. But otherwise, uh, I guess we're out of time. Can I let them go home? Absolutely. All right. All right. Frank, thank you so much.